Thank you for being here today, students. And in case you see some unfamiliar faces around you, and I have intentionally not just put them all up in the front, but I wanted them to mingle so that they can feel you and feel your spirits and energy. We have our board of trustees are here with us. They've been here all day. Wait, wait, I'm actually give them a real rounding NIAC welcome. All the trustees, please stand. Come on, all the trustees. Come on, let's give them a real welcome. They're so used to us having reserved seats for them, so when they came and they said, where's our reserved seats? I said, no reserved seats today. <laughs> Sorry about that. But we are happy that they've been with us all day. You, got, you need to know these men and women, they love the Lord and they love what is happening here at NIAC and the Alliance Seminary. So um, you may not know them personally, but just whenever you feel so inclined to do it, lift up a prayer for our trustees because they, along with our president and our executive team, they're the ones that get the mind of Christ for what God wants to do here at NIAC. So don't we need to be praying for them? Yes. Amen. So here we are, and um, can't lose that. That's my parking garage ticket. <laughs> Dr. Stanley John, received his PhD from Asbury Theological Seminary, and he is the Associate Professor of Intercultural Studies here at the Alliance Theological Seminary. And uh, Stanley's been serving at ATS for six years. His research focuses on the intersection of world Christianity, global migration, and immigrant churches. Dr. Stanley is a licensed minister of the Christian and Missionary Alliance, and he serves as the teaching pastor at Ridgeway Alliance Church in White Plains, New York. And coming up soon, he will be the pastor for a new church campus plant in New Rochelle, yes. launching in March. Yes. Wish you well in that, brother. Stanley and his precious wife, Eunice, have a 20-month-old son by the name of Philip, Please help me give a warm welcome to Dr. Stanley John. Well, good evening, everybody. Some of you might know that, um, uh, of course, you can tell I'm Indian. Uh, I, I look Indian, I talk Indian. You know, there's no such thing as talking Indian. Um, and my wife is Chinese, uh, Chinese, uh, but bo born in Taiwan. Uh, so uh, every time I hear the name Philip, I always think of, okay, the time when we got, you know, when I married my wife, I wasn't really thinking about uh, what our babies are going to look like, you know what I mean? <laughs> I know that's what a lot of people say when you, when people find out you're a mixed uh, couple or whatever, they say, oh, you're going to make great babies, you know? <laughs> this is really awkward comment, right? <laughs> so anyhow, we get married, and of course, we're now expecting our baby, and so uh, it hits me. I don't know what this baby is going to look like. I have never met an Indian Chinese baby before. So do you know what I do? What would you do? Google. Google, right? Because I'm looking at the ultrasound, right? Until then, I didn't really have a problem. But when I saw the ultrasound, and I saw the baby's lips, and it looks a lot like my wife's lips, and, and my wife starts tearing up, and I'm like, what is this baby going to look like? And so I started Googling Indian Chinese babies, and guess what came up? There is a whole thing called Chindians. I know, it sounds like a racial joke, right? Except it's a real category. There are people in Malaysia, because Malaysia, of course, is part Malay, uh, part Indian, and part Chinese. So uh, the mixed baby, there's a whole community of them, and they do video blogs about what it's like trying to negotiate Chinese and Indian identity. But that was a freebie. It's got nothing to do with my sermon. You ready? <laughs> I'm going to be preaching today from 1 Samuel chapter 13. The title of my talk today is Clarity of Heart. Clarity of Heart in the Midst of Compulsion. Clarity of Heart in the Midst of Compulsion. I'm going to read from verse 3 all the way to verse 14. I read a little fast. I've always talked fast. And when I moved to New York, I started talking faster. But you'll be able to track, right? Verse 3. Jonathan attacked the Philistine outpost at Geba, 
And the Philistines heard about it. Then Saul had the trumpet blown throughout the land and said, Let the Hebrews hear. So all the Israel heard the news. Saul has attacked the Philistine outpost. And now Israel has become obnoxious to the Philistines, and the people were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. The Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They went up and camped at Michmash, east of Beth Avon. When the Israelites saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard pressed, they hiding in caves and thickets among they began hiding in caves and thickets and among the rocks and in pits and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived. And Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. Verse 13. You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for a long time, for all time, but now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler over his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Weighty, isn't it? Will you bow your hearts with me in prayer? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit that inspired these words. We thank you for how you have been at work throughout human history. And Lord, now we pause to say our hearts are open to you. Lord, we want to hear a word from you. We want our hearts to be washed by your blood, washed by the water of your word, and purify our hearts. Give us a pure heart today, Lord. And give us the desire to desire the one thing that is most important, your presence and your voice. Help us to hear your voice and long for your voice and give ourselves to your voice, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 The question, my friends, I want to reflect on today is this. What are the competing voices that push you and pull you away from following the voice of the Lord? Amen. What are the competing voices that push us and pull us away from hearing the voice of the Lord? I want us to look at three key leadership mistakes that can deal, derail your young ministry. Who wants to hear that sermon, huh? Oh, yeah. Leadership mistakes that derail your young ministry. So, of course, we love talking about David, right? David is this guy. Samuel came to anoint the son of Jesse. He's not even in the group, right? All of his other brothers are like, are, are, are so much more handsome, so much more beautiful. And he didn't even make the cut. He was still on the fields. We love his story, how God chose him, how God picked him up out of nowhere, provided for him. He went to face Goliath, the spirit. We love that story. But what about Saul? What about Saul? Did it always have to end this way? Now, of course, making, making, giving a king to Israel was not God's plan A, but God gave in to Israel's request, and God would have made this a success. Even as you see Saul starting off, you know, first battle, you see the Spirit of God came over him, although he came on him and he broke out in anger. He had a little bit of an anger problem, but still... We gave him victory. We have all signs that God was going to make this a victorious thing. It starts off really good, right? Saul is really an admirable character, right? Who was chosen, anointed, but yet whose life ended tragically. And it's a lesson for each of us, right? That you might be king in your world, right? But you might not last as a king in your world, and you might end tragically. So what was it that led to Saul's downfall. He seemed to have everything going for him. In fact, if you look in chapter 9, right, when Samuel finds him, 
he is, he is what I would call very handsome, right? Not what I would call, the Bible calls him handsome. Here's what the chapter 9 verse 2 says. Kish had a son. Aren't you glad it was not donuts, right? Kish had a son named Saul and as, as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel. So clearly the Bible says he was handsome. Here's another one. Samuel chapter 9 verse 21 says, And to whom is all the desire of Israel turned if not to you and your whole family line? And what does Saul answer? Am I not from the tribe of Benjamin, from the smallest tribe of Israel? And is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you say something, think things like these to me? He's humble. He's handsome. He's humble. And here's another one. In the next chapter, the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of God comes upon him and he starts prophesying. Chapter 10, verse 10 says, When he and his servant arrived at Gibeah, a procession of prophets met, and the Spirit of God came forth powerfully on him and he joined in that prophesying. Folks, this is your handsome, you know, humble and holy. This is, ladies, your perfect man, right? <laughs> a feet taller than everyone. I was going to use the word hot, but then I thought I'd make it a little sanctified here. <laughs> I mean, this is humble, hot, and holy. You know, this is your perfect package. But the question is, where did it go so wrong? And you begin to get a hint of this in this passage that we read. Jonathan had gone out and attacked one of the Philistine outposts. Of course, he destroyed them, right? But then they are all enraged and they bring their entire army. Saul's got 3,000. Jonathan's got like another 1,000 or something. But these guys have soldiers like the sand on the seashore. Innumerable soldiers. 6,000 charioteers. 6,000 chariots. Equal number to the soldiers that is on Saul's side. So he is knocking his knees together. He's petrified, right? The battle lines are drawn. Everybody is gathered. They're going to attack. And they're going to annihilate Israel. And Saul is 30 years old, 30 years old, young leader, just installed as king, and he's got to face this massive battle. He had this little, little win of a stint in the past, but now he's got his big test. And now it says Samuel had told him, the Bible says, to wait for seven days, and then he would come and offer the sacrifice. In fact, if you turn a couple chapters behind, in 1 Samuel chapter 10, Here's the word that's there. Go down ahead of me to Gilgal, Samuel said. I will surely come to you and sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, but you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. But what we're told is this. He waits till the seventh day. Good for him, right? But not seeing Samuel, he saw that the men were scattering he decided to take matters into his own hands and perform the sacrifices that was meant for the prophet to do. Saul confused. His first issue was he confused his role as king as though it was an autocratic role. He didn't realize that the king was supposed to be submitted to the voice of God. He heard the word. It was a command of the Lord. And yet he said, ah, no, I am going to, I can take care of this. And just as he is doing it, we're told Samuel shows up and he asks, what have you done? Here's the first point. Samuel's first mistake is what I might call the tyranny of compulsion. The tyranny of compulsion. Notice Saul's answer to Samuel when Samuel asks him, what have you done? He says, when I saw that the men were scattering, he looked around, saw the shifting people. He was trying to read the crowd. And there were some people who have no moral clarity as leaders. They are constantly looking at the crowd. And as soon as the crowd says, yeah, they're like, oh, they like that. I should keep going in that direction. No moral clarity. The crowd's response is shaping his moral vision. The ultimate goal in this case is that the approval of the people becomes the plan of the day. And then he says, secondly, he says, Samuel, hey, I waited for you, man, but you did not come. It's only the seventh day. <laughs> and he says, I waited till the seventh day. I didn't decide to wait for the whole seventh day. I waited till the seventh day. And he says, again, you see shifting responsibility. And then he says, and the Philistines were assembling. He's like, there were real challenges in front of me. You don't understand. And then he says, and I thought... I haven't sought the Lord's favor. Interesting, isn't it? He is rationalizing and saying, oh, I am doing this for God. Huh? 
I am disobeying. Yeah, I know. But I'm doing this so that God will be on my side. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offerings. I, it's very interesting how Samuel responded, right? Samuel says to Saul, you have acted foolishly. Such an interesting word. You have acted foolishly. He says, I felt compelled. I looked around. I saw people leaving. I saw the army coming and I took action. I felt compelled. And, and sometimes we like to think of leadership as rising to the occasion. Huh? And, it, and it's not about, and in the next chapter, in the next paragraph, we see Jonathan rising up, telling his armor bearer, breaking away from the rest of the group, saying, let's go and take a look at the Philistine outpost. If they say, come over, then we will go over to them. If they say, you stay there, then we will stay here. Remember that? You don't hear a word of the Lord there. He is taking initiative, and he approaches, and they say, come over here. And then the Bible says, he says, God is with us. He went and destroyed them. And of course, then we know how the battle ended, right? So there we see there was an initiative, there was, God is not against innovation. God is not against initiative. But what God is against is when there is a clear word from the Lord, the responsibility is to follow. And that is why he said you are foolish. The opposite of this is what? To act wisely. To act wisely is to unswervingly hold fast to the Lord's commands. And here's where Saul went wrong. It's the tendency to be self-reliant versus God-reliant, right? It's our tendency to give in to the pressures and feel compelled rather than relying on what God has said even till our last breath. If we are people of principle, governed by a heart after God, we do not act on impulse, but we act according to godly discernment, isn't it? We are not after impulse, we're after godly discernment. You know, I went to Bible school, so I was 18 years old. I went to a small Bible school in Rhode Island. And there was a young man in Bible school. He was one of my best friends. He had a you know, terrible, terrible background, right? I mean, he, he had to flee the Khmer Rouge. He's Cambodian. He had to flee the Khmer Rouge. His parents were teachers, so they were coming to kill him. And so his parents fled uh, to a refugee camp in the Philippines, and that is where he was born. He, his parents' mom was pregnant with him when he fled, and finally he came to the U.S. They settled him in Providence, Rhode Island, and he got involved in Asian gangs just to survive as a young kid. And at 14, he was in a gang fight, and he got framed for murder. Mm -hmm. And at 14, he was facing 35 to life in prison. They signed a plea bargain, and uh, he signed it, and he got out. Uh, well, he had to plead guilty, but he, uh, he finally got out a few years later. And he comes to Bible school because he got saved in jail. Somebody met him, shared the gospel with him. He got saved, and now he is in Bible school with us, right? Great guy on fire for the Lord. We go through our first year together, second year together, third year, and now we're in our senior year together. And this guy is strong. He's built real well. He would go out and do all this construction work, painting. And, you know, and when you're 20 years old and you can bring in a few hundred dollars and, you know, other kids at the school don't have any money, you know, you may, you, you can, you know, uh, flex your muscles a little bit, you know. And so he starts involving, being involved in a church and um, he needed a car. You know, right? So it's not New York City. You know, most places in the world outside of New York City, you need a car, you know. So he, 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 he needs a car and his pastor who led him to the Lord says to him, hey, I'm going to get you a car. Gives him an old Volvo. All right. It's an old car. Uh, but then a week later, the pastor had to take it back because there was somebody else's in the church. His car broke down and needed it. And, and so he said, just be patient with me. I'll, I'll, I'll fix it and I'll get it back to you in two weeks. But my buddy, let's call him Peter, decided to go and finance a new car. When he's 20 years old in Bible school, working construction jobs, decides to go. And so he pulls on campus in his nice Mitsubishi Galant. You know, well, he probably didn't do that. He probably was doing this. But either way, seats all the way back, hands up. I mean, he is happy as a can. He's so happy. And he drives to, now listen. When you're 20 years old and you show up on, I know it's a Mitsubishi Galan, but still, you show up in a Mitsubishi Galan, you're a pretty big deal on campus, you know what I mean? 
he drives to his church to show it off to his pastor. And his pastor looks at him and says, you fool, that car was for you. Needless to say, Peter did not finish with us when we all graduated that year. He couldn't finish. He was in too much debt. He had to drop out of school. And he fell back into the world that he came from. Uh, but by God's grace, right, uh, over five years later, uh, he came back to the Lord. And, uh, and he called me and asked me to be the best man at his wedding. Because he, he had already been living, you know. So, but God restored him. And now he and his wife are on fire serving the Lord at a church in Boston. The question is, thank God, God redeemed Peter's life. But the question is, at what point, he never ended up finishing Bible school. He was never able to launch into full-time ministry. And this guy is the one that everybody would say, man, this guy, he would go in front of Congress to try to advocate for kids who are juveniles. And you wonder, like, man, why couldn't this kid finish? Where did it go wrong? Where do we give in to the compulsions that we face? It might be voices, it might be needs, it might be money in your pockets, it might be somebody forcing you to do something, but what compulsions do we give in to and we do not heed the voice of the Lord? It gets worse for Saul, right? Right after this, he continues. Then you see Jonathan and his armor bearer going and doing this. But then in the next section, you see Paul, uh, Saul calling Abijah the priest. So he finds out Jonathan did this. The whole Philistine camp is in disarray. God brought a confusion. They're all skitter scattering. And so he says, hey, Abijah, Abijah, come over here. Bring the ark with you. And we say the Abijah comes with this ephod. And the idea is, and he says, he's, the ephod carried the Urim and the Thummim. Urim and the Thummim were the pieces that they used to discern what God's will is. So Saul is like, come discern, should I go into this battle or not? And just as the discerning process was taking place, we are told, he says in verse chapter, chapter 14, verse 18, Saul said to Ahijah, bring it. While Saul was talking to the priest, the tumult in the Philistine camp increased more and more. So Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. The scene is probably the priest wearing the ephod, right? Trying to discern. And you see Saul's second mistake, which is this. The first is the tyranny of compulsion. But the second is act first, pray later. <laughs> act first, pray later when convenient. He says to him, withdraw your hand. He is holding the Urim and Thummim, trying to discern if it's God's will. And he says, withdraw your hand. I'm ready to take action. We'll pray about this later. And you know he's thinking about this because at the end of the battle in verse 35, we are told Saul does set up an altar to the Lord and worships God. But this is the second mistake. When do we seek the Lord? Do we seek God before action or after action? I don't know about y'all, but in Indian culture, y'all might not have this. We've got this thing called arranged marriages. Y'all know what this is, right? I'm not talking about like little farmer going on a village, you know, to the farm, see somebody says, oh, I got a two-year-old, you got a three-year-old, okay, 20 years from now, let them give. I'm not talking about that, right? This is about uncles and aunties and pastors and everybody that knows you is trying to set you up with people, right? So I got my share of phone calls, you know, especially when I would preach, they would not see a ring on my hand, like, oh, okay, let's give them a phone, you know? So I got quite a few of these phone calls and of course, every one of these calls, I would pray, I would ask the Lord, and sometimes, you know, there would be an interest, sometimes mm -hmm, there was not interest, so I would, of course, communicate with my parents. My parents are very godly, so I would bring them along in the discernment process. And of course, in Indian culture, the highest prestigious job that you could possibly have is that of a... Come on, Sanjay Gupta. I mean, he's going to be a medical doctor, right? Like, this is the zenith of success, right? And so, what do you do? You know, and you always try to match education level. So when you have a PhD, you try to find somebody with a doctor, you know? So I got a bunch of calls from medical doctors, right? This is like the height of recommendations. And so I would call my dad. I would say, hey, dad, we got this call. And, and, and I said, I'm not interested to move forward. And my dad would say... And I love my dad. I said, Dad's a very godly man. 
but I'm going to use a couple of stories today that's not so they get the positive about my dad. My dad would say, Stanley, but uh, don't say no so quickly. She's a U.S. citizen and she's a medical doctor. This could work in your favor, you know? You know? And, and, and sometimes I have to tell my dad, I have to kind of come down off my spiritual high horse and talk to him very practically and say, Dad, just because she's a medical doctor doesn't mean that she's past her boards you know i have to like say like very <laughs> practical things like that to try to get him to back off but my dad would say things like hey don't give this up so quickly right you know let's let's engage this let's process this a little bit you know yeah yeah praying and all is important but you you, you need a visa to stay in the country you know <laughs> you are an international student Act first. We'll pray about this later. And there's a lot of marriages that have got into terrible disarray, especially in arranged marriage. Because what motivates is not seeking the will of God. What motivates is, oh, does this match our social status? You know, and I have to make this comment in my anthropology class. I can make fun of my people. You can't make fun of my people, okay? <laughs> the tyranny of compulsion. Act now, pray later. And here's the last one. And there's lots, right? I mean, if you trace this down, he is just eaten up by jealousy at the end of his life. He's at the house of a witch trying to seek the voice of God, but he yeah. can't hear it. He's trying to hear it from a witch, at the witch of Ender. But before we get that, this is still early in his ministry, right? Here's the third story that I want to say, and so we'll close with this. We are told in 1 Samuel 15 that Samuel comes to Saul and says, Hey, I am the one that anointed you king. Here's what the word of the Lord is. You need to go and destroy the Amal Amalekites. Completely wipe them out. Because when we were refugees coming out of Egypt, they ambushed us. Who ambushes refugees? Who does that? How sick do you have to be to hurt people that are vulnerable? And he says, these guys did it. They are atrocious. And in that era of time, they were horrible to people. Uh, they gouge people's eyes out. They drag them on uh, behind horses to kill them. And so God says, you have to go and wipe these people out, right? So Saul go and he says, you need not just the people, the cattle, everything you got to wipe clean. Now, this is a bit difficult, right, for us in our modern sensibilities to wrap our minds around. You know, but picture this. The warfare was not so much between human beings, right? The warfare was between the God of this people and the God of this other people. So it was really a show of who is the great God of the world, right? And secondly, the other concept to keep in mind is this is God's judgment that God is exacting upon a people, an entire community that has been so depraved. And this is my, it's talking about the holiness, the purity of God, right? So it's like, if I were to show you, if I were to tell you, okay, I've got a couple of dollars here, right? I've got a $10 bill here and I've got a 20, right? That's all I got here. So I got, I got a Hamilton and I got a Jackson, right? So imagine I've got a couple of Benjamins here too. Some of you do, I know. Thank you to you, right? So, and, and imagine these are ill-gotten cash, all right? Imagine somebody got hurt and I stole this from them, all right? Or I got this from abusing somebody, or I, I killed somebody to get this, right? And I get saved, all right? I get saved, I'm in church, and the voice of the Lord comes to me. Okay, son, I forgive you of your sins, all right? But here's what I need you to do. I want you to tear it all up. Tear it all up, all right? And I still look at my stash and I say, hmm, <laughs> Hamilton? Okay, I'll tear Hamilton. Uh, Jackson, okay, Jackson, I mean, if there was Tubman, I don't know, about, but it's okay, either way, okay, I'll take, but that Washington, but with, with Benjamin? Oh, the Benjamin is hard, Lord. Washington is fine, I'll tear all those, but Benjamin, man, I can't tear. You know what I'll do? I'll put this in the offering plate. That's what you see Saul doing. Saul goes in. He sees all the people. He says, no, no, no. I'll kill all of these guys. But Agag, the king, I'm bringing him back. And all the cattle and all the stuff, I'll kill all of them. But guess what? The fat and cast, I'm going to bring that back. Right? And so what you begin to see is Saul is negotiating. And so then Samuel shows up and asks him, hey, did you do? And he said, I did exactly what the Lord told me to do. I obeyed. And then Samuel says, but why do I hear bleating of sheep in my ear? 
And Saul responds and says, The soldiers wanted to offer it to the Lord your God. Did you notice that? Shifted. Shifted responsibility to the shoulders, soldiers, and shifted responsibility to saying, It's your God, not mine. And here's the third mistake he makes. The tyranny of compulsion. Act now, pray later. And here's the last one. It's partial obedience and negotiation is still disobedience. Partial obedience and negotiation is still disobedience. In my final year, you know, being an international student is not easy. Any international students here? I mean, it's tough, right? You're pretty vulnerable. You don't know what your future is. I was on an F1 international student visa, so I was in my final year of my doctoral program and I have no idea where God's going to open a door for me okay but I get a call I get an email I was in Kuwait doing research and I get an email and this gentleman offers me this great job it's like a dream job for a, someone who has a PhD in missions right the job is to travel to this organization it's a mission organization they want me to be a mission mobilizer they have about 200 missionaries in 80 or something different countries in the world my job is to travel to all these countries and train them to do ministry pretty amazing isn't it and so i read this beautiful email very flowery email why they think i'm the perfect fit for this job i read it i look at my dad and i say dad see this email it's really nice, but it's not for me. It's really nice, but it's not for me. And again, the practical dad, very godly also, but very practical, <laughs> says, hey, it's a good job, you know? It, visa, good visa, good salary. And uh, I said, it's not for me. So I wrote a nice letter. I said, thank you so much for thinking of me. I am not the one for your job, right? And they write me a nice letter back and say, you are so humble for this very reason. You are the perfect fit for this job. <laughs> And I wrote him back and I said, thank you, you're very kind, but I have to focus on my dissertation and I just cannot accept this right now. And they write back and they say, don't worry, we'll hold it for a whole year until you finish. And so my practical dad, I love my dad. If any of you, you know, you're like, what, man, he's really bashing on his dad. No, no, my, I love my dad, I adore my dad. But my dad says, hey, listen, if they're willing to hold a job for you for a year, what's wrong with you? Consider it then. Like, why do you have to say no now? Right? And I felt like a little bit of a Balaam. Do you know the story of Balaam? God said, no, don't go with them. And then they show up a second round with all this money and with all the prestigious people. And he's like, oh, God told me no, but let me go pray and come back to you. Remember that? It's like, if God has spoken, we don't negotiate with God again. Right? So I wrote them back and I said, thank you. It's not, not now. I do not feel the Lord allowing me to accept this job. Right? A year later, I graduate, May 20, 2014. And I'm walking out of the graduation ceremony, and I see that gentleman who offered me the job. A year later, and he says to me, Stanley, that job is still open. <laughs> and I'm walking to the car. I have 90 days to leave the country or find a job. Right? I'm walking to my car. And I hear the voice of the Lord say, do not negotiate after God has already spoken. Mm. Right? God has spoken. It's not people speaking. I'm talking about God spoke. And I knew in the depth of I can't, you know. I, so I said, that is very, very nice. But that's not for me. My mom in March, of first week of March of 2014, had prayed and told me, God is going to open a door for you the first week of June. And on June 2nd, I was preaching in a church in New Jersey where a graduate of Nyack was attending. Her dad was the pastor. Her brother was my roommate when I was 18, like many years ago, back in Bible school. She told me, have you thought about teaching at Nyack? I said, I'd love to teach at Nyack, but there's no job opening. She said, well, I can contact the dean for you. So she emails Ron on Facebook. Doesn't even say, hey, how are you? She says, hey, is Nyack hiring? Like no pleasantries, nothing, right? And sure enough, second, first week of June, God opened the door. Second week of June, I was in the office talking to Ron. Third, fourth week of June, I was on a plane coming here for my interview. And by end of July, I moved here to take this job. Wow. I share all that to say this. You don't know. And this is, I'm living my dream. 
And I think of how quickly I could have squandered the life that God had for me if I settled for petty ambitions and quick fixes and given into the compulsions of people or context or solutions when I would have missed what God had. The question for you, my friends, is will you act now and pray later? Will you give in to the compulsion? Will you negotiate after what God has already spoken? Because here is what David does for us. He gives us the antidote to the tyranny of compulsion. He says in Psalm 27 and verse 14, he says, Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Take heart and wait for the Lord. Your most powerful faith-filled response, my friends, sometimes is to just Hang steady, because God is at work. Yet second, the tyranny of act first, pray later. David tells us in Psalm 63, verse 1, he says, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. The tyranny of act first, pray later. God calls us to be people who seek his face first. Amen. Yes. And finally... Instead of partial obedience, God calls us to wholehearted devotion. Here's how David puts it in 119. He says, I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. My friends, when God has spoken his word, David says, I rejoice in following your word, what you have spoken, like people delight when they win the lottery. When God has spoken, my friends, the call for us is to just hold on. His voice is enough. He has called you. He has brought you here. Do not let money stop you from following God's voice. Do not let people stop you from following God's voice. You hold on to his voice. He will not fail you. Amen? Yeah. Will you pray with me? Lord, we pause now to just say from the depths of our hearts to you, we want to be people devoted to your voice. We want to be people that seek after you, that rely on your voice, on godly discernment. Lord, we don't want our lives to be derailed. Lord, we want to be people of the word. We want to be people who hold on to your voice. Help us be people, Lord, that just love to be in that garden with you. As the songwriter said, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. And the voice I hear calling on my ears, the Son of God discloses and he walks with me and he talks to me and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other can ever know. Lord, we pray for that to be the reality in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Would you stand with me? Oh, that's such a good tune, huh? Let me pray a blessing over you. Go in the peace.